me invite you to open your Bibles to the book of James. So we've started a new study last week. And this morning, we're in James chapter 1, and I want to read verses 2, 3, and 4. And I'm speaking on this subject, the darkest hour. Stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. The Bible says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. If you're going through something difficult right now, you probably will take a pen and write something like this parenthetically in your Bible. <laughs> you are kidding, aren't you? What's he smoking? The Bible says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience or perseverance. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect or mature and complete, lacking nothing. Speak into our hearts in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I was thinking about how to start this sermon and I wrote it down and I think some people maybe that haven't heard me much would think, what a way to give us your first line. Here it is. This passage is pregnant with truth. Each verse is simply loaded with truth that has the potential to build and to bless. James, realizing many of his former church members are now scattered all through the regions about and outside of Jerusalem, and knowing that persecution and trials awaited them there, writes from his heart to his own church family, many of them, words of instructions and of encouragement. I want you to listen to the threefold ring in this passage. You, you can't miss it. It's there for us all to see. He speaks of joy, faith, and patience. He speaks of counting, knowing, and letting. He speaks of various trials, testing of your faith, perfect work. He refers to my brethren, your faith, you may. He talks of fall, testing, lacking. He uses words that move us into the realm of personal, possessive, and perspective or possible. You, your, you. The question seems to ask, in the sermon I wrote two years ago, can good come out of trials? He uses descriptive words such as evaluation, production, cooperation, and completion. He is reminding us of something that the Apostle Paul, after we showed the major contrast in the theological versus the practical application of the theological last week, he reminds us that when a believer responds to trials in the context of this truth, this can be said of you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3. We are bound to give thanks always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly. And the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. Did you see that? Grows exceedingly, abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God. Why? Because of your patience and faith in the context of all of your persecution and tribulations that you endure. We all love the mountaintop, but we learn more if we respond right in the valley. This reminds us that in trials, your faith can be greatly enlarged. Also, you can experience the steadfastness of Christ. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, 13, that though we are faithless, God is faithful. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 3, these words, Finally, brethren, Pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men 
For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. Who will establish you? That's a word that is used in the context of someone who builds a large building, the foundation, and will guard you from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. Now, may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. So let's begin with our family. See how far we can get this morning. In verse number two, count it all joy. Now, and I'm going to give you a statement here that I believe is one of the keys to unlock this passage. There must be some hidden truth in here that our vernacular has not allowed us to understand. Count it all joy when I fall into various trials. The word count is con translated consider. But let me tell you what the word literally means. Think forward. Count it all joy when you think forward. Normally when I'm going through something I don't like, I just don't like it. But if I can think forward, I may say if I respond right in what I'm going through when it's over, it'll help me. You regard. The word count there is a tense in the Greek text which signifies that this joy that we read about comes after the trial. And we're going to see that illustrated beautifully in the Scriptures. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 11, listen to the words that are in the context of the cross. No chastening or discipline seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, forward thinking, afterward, it yields Oh, we got a crop coming. It yields the peaceable fruit, peaceable fruit out of pain, of righteousness to those who are trained by it. If you're going through something difficult this morning and you're walking in the Spirit, continue to ask Jesus, help me to not miss it. What are you trying to teach me? What? is this training all about and then wait so what does it not mean when he says consider it all joy james is not ordering an all-encompassing joyful emotion during severe trials man i read what they said about you yeah praise the lord i hope some more right this week no that's not real there's nothing that comes close to that in the Bible. Nor is he demanding that his readers must enjoy trials or that trials are joyful. He knows, as did the writer of Hebrews, that no discipline seems pleasant at the time but painful. James is not commanding that we rejoice upon hearing that our career position has been given to a friend or that the neighbor's child has leukemia or that one spouse is an adulteress. Rather, James is commanding the conscience embrace of the Christian understanding of life which brings joy into the trials that come because of our Christianity. It's when you're suffering for doing what is right when you're suffering for doing what is right. So James says, consider it pure joy, uh, which means to make a deliberate and careful decision to experience joy even in times of trouble. Paul put it this way when he was writing a letter of encouragement called 2 Corinthians. And in chapter 7 and verse 4, listen to the language of the great apostle. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my boasting on behalf, your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all of our tribulation. Well, wait a minute. Was he joyful or was he in tribulation? Yes. Job put it this way, 
just about in the middle of his journey. Job 23.10. But God knows the way that I take when he has tested me. I shall come forth as gold. Only God can take sorrow, touch it, and it become gold. What is God doing in my life? I'm trying to obey. I'm trying to submit. I'm trying to be like Isaiah and say, Lord, the best I know, I heard a voice behind me saying, this is my way. Walk in it. But Lord, this is a hard, what are you doing? And he would respond and say, making a little gold. I know what some of you are thinking right now. Well, I... I think I'll just ask the Lord to give it to my neighbor. <laughs> so James did not say that the trial is a joy. Job did not consider losing his health and his entire family with the exception of his wife a joy. But he looked forward to the joy that would follow his trial. There's three different ways to say it. You've seen it through the years. Outlook determines outcome. Attitude determines action. Attitude determines altitude. Jesus looked beyond his suffering. You know, one of my favorite passages in my Bible is Hebrews 12. One, two, and three. I think I memorized this in my first church. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses... Lay us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily besets us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus. The word that he's used there, I'm told, means looking away from everything else, razor sharp focus on Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Here it is. Who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let me tell you one thing you'll not find in the Holy of Holies. A chair. Because the work of the Old Testament priest was never finished. But as the writer of Hebrews speaks to these Jews in the context of the New Testament, they don't need any more sacrifices to be offered because God has just sent Jesus. He is the perfect once for all, all-time champion. He has defeated sin, grave, hell, and death, and he sat down. And it means that what he came to do has been done. It is finished to telestai, consummated. And so Jesus went, I'm about, well, Jesus. Jesus. I like that. Jesus. Jesus, with the capacity that you and I don't have, looked beyond the cross. He was on the cross thinking forward. And he looked out there and he said, uh, he's a hoodlum. Uh, his daddy left him when he was seven. But I, I'm looking at him like I did Simon Peter. I, I don't just see the wavering one. I think if I can move into him, I believe he could become like a rock. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the cross and think forward about all those heathen that are in desperate need of somebody to pay a price. And I'm going to shed my blood and die on the cross and I'm going to... I'm going to do it with joy. No wonder Peter, he got a glimpse of it being a fisherman, carrying a knife, and cussing. And when Jesus changed him, he said, this stuff is joy, unspeakable and full of 
glory. It's forward thinking. wonder what that songwriter was thinking when they penned those words. Do you see what I see? Question is, what's he seeing? How about Jesus when he said, before Abraham was? I am. Jesus looked beyond his suffering. Joy. Did Jesus count Calvary a joy? Certainly not. But thinking ahead, he thought past Calvary and therefore he bore up under the trial. So he says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. When you fall. You've heard it before. It's not new, but not if you fall. It's inevitable. It's inescapable. It's unavoidable. When you fall. You may say, is that word coined anywhere in the New Testament that uh, just shouts at us? It sure is. When you read the story of the encounter of the Good Samaritan with the three men who were passing on the road, you'll find that word shouting at you. He fell among thieves. Same word. Stumble or encounter. Luke's gospel describes it. Uh, Gives the word picture of warning about impending problems. It's a word it means to be encircled so this is a time that you're surrounding you can't get out you are beat up evidently you're overpowered therefore you don't have the potential in and of yourself to escape just like the good Samaritan you are dependent on somebody coming there to where you are and helping you out of that ditch and by the way you can't schedule or plan for a trip Could you imagine the good Samaritan leaving home and saying to his wife, "Uh, I'll be back, but pray for me at a certain place on this journey. uh, I'm going to be robbed and beat up. Pray that the people get there in time. I don't think his wife would allow him to go. Even the prospect of that uh, is challenging. Sometimes when I'm getting ready to go on an international trip and I'm maybe getting ready to go into one of the areas that we're not even to mention to you where we will be and who we'll be ministering to and nothing can be said on our website about it. I can say nothing here where the World Wide Web would carry it out. Dangerous places. And somebody desiring to be encouraging comes to me and says, I had a dream. I feel real bad about you going. I feel like something terrible is going to happen on this trip. So he says, how do you treat that? Momentarily, it puts the fear of God in me. How would you like to respond to the person that tells you that? Keep your dreams to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't schedule or plan for a trial. They always catch us unaware. Can't you hear the story? Things were going so well. I was just serving God, having a good time, trying to be faithful in giving, trying to raise my family. Out of nowhere, out of nowhere. Next thing I know, I was encircled by this. A spiritual equivalent to a pop quiz. The compound word fall means to fall into and be surrounded by it. Anybody here this morning fallen into something and you're surrounded by it? The Bible says he fall into various trials. That means multicolored. If we were to take time and everybody in here was to be honest and the mic would be circulated through the room and we'd just pass it down to Alan, if you were going through a particular trial, you would stand up and just in one phrase, you would tell what your trial is. There's no tellings. Are y'all listening? No tellings. Think of the Sunday school teacher when you teach next hour. No telling how many trials are going on in this room. Multi sickness, accident, disappointment, other painful circumstances. Trials are not alike. Some are job related. 
Some are financial. Some are domestic. Uh, some are the results of our fear of failure. Others are the result of us aging, guilt, competition, problems at the office, day-by-day -day experiences in the home. All sorts, all colors, all stripes. Now, I'll do this and I'm through. This is interesting. The word trial in verse 2 and the word temptation in verse 12 is the same word. Well, you're not saying a trial and a temptation is the same, are you? I didn't say that. What are you saying? I'm saying that you understand what the word means in its context. Let me illustrate. Since the context serves to disclose what it's used for, trial is a testing which comes from external situations and works itself inwardly, okay? So I'm going about my own life, and then something hits me. It, it knocks me off my spiritual axis. And the bottom line is, I didn't ask for this. Like right now, many of you are in this economic downturn crisis. I want you to hear me carefully. Your Christianity is not contingent on how powerful of a blow the world can throw at you. It is contingent on what you have inside of you through the fortifying of your soul to withstand the attack. You ever heard someone say this? They made me so angry. It was enough to make a preacher curse. What are they doing? They're trying to get themselves off the hook by comparing themselves that everybody would respond this way. No, the only preacher that will cuss when he goes through bad times, and by the way, I've got to be honest with you, I have been tempted to cuss, but I haven't. I have another confession. I did get mad so, one, so mad one day that I wrote a bad word on a piece of paper and got Jim Law to sign it. But I'm no, just kidding. <laughs> so we're going through trials. You didn't ask for this. We didn't ask for the economy to go sour right after we bought our house or right after we took a new job or right after we got married or right after our child came. What's this all about? What James says, I'm going to be practical with you. I'm going to show you that the emphasis of my teaching is not, this is so good, on the severity of the trial, but on the source within you that responds to what this world delivers. What, what does people like to do when they going through trials. Tell you about their trial. <laughs> That's what happened to you. <laughs> that ain't nothing. Let me tell you what I'm going through. And, and, and kind of like you say this, <laughs> I've never heard anything like that. There is no temptation or trial taking us, but such as is common. There's nothing you're going through. Are y'all listening? Nothing you're going through. I say it again. Nothing you're going through that thousands upon thousands upon thousands have already gone through. Why do we have cancer support groups? Because when you find out you got cancer, you'd like to hear from somebody else that's dealing with cancer. Is that right, sis? Now, temptation, I'm through. Well, pastor, if a trial is a testing which comes from an external situation, tries to work itself inward, what is temptation? It's a solicitation which comes to the inward parts and works itself outward 
In trials, two things happen at the same time. The temptation to run out from under the trial and please the flesh and wait a minute and blame God and everybody else. I'll tell you what, I wouldn't be going through this if it were not for. What is it about Christians that they can feel better about what they're going through if they can find somebody to blame for it? Have you ever heard it said that you'll never be the person you ought to be until you take full responsibility for who you are under Christ? And then last of all, a test to see if we will honor God by obeying his word. I don't know about you, but I thank God for Genesis 37 through Genesis 39. Joseph, aren't you glad that even though God gave us the story, and by the way, I love my Bible because it tells you of the good, bad, and the ugly. He tells me all David's struggles, Samson's tr struggles. But aren't you glad that he tells you about one that was willing to lose his coat in order to keep his character? Heavenly Father, help us to have the capacity because we have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16, to think forward. I don't know why in the world you're allowing many of your dear people to go through what they're going through, but may they see it as a call to better fortify their soul against the attacks that are inevitable, unavoidable in our life. And thank you that Jesus at the cross thought forward, died rose and saves. In Jesus' name, amen.